Hello there. Today, we're going to have a look at Mercedes and basically just have a bit of a kind of starter guide for them. We'll be playing on hard development, hard race difficulty, um, but honestly, we're probably not going to be going through the entirety of the first season. The goal is going to be very simple. We're going to show how you can easily dominate with Mercedes in 23 with just uh, making the right path, right sliders. It's been something that has been requested for, well, a long time. Every few videos I get, uh, there's a comment that asks, can I show how you would do Mercedes to get them quickly back up to the top? And that's what we're going to do today. It's uh, probably a little bit of a dead horse at the moment, but we'll have a look at uh, how we can make this happen. If you have been enjoying my uh, stuff here with us, please like, subscribe, helps me out a ton. And with that out of the way, let's just get back into it. But yeah, we're going to go with Mercedes. We're going to go with hard difficulty. Kind of need to, I think, to make it a little bit more interesting. And uh, the strategy here is going to be basically the same that we did with Williams, where we're going to be developing the first car pieces extremely quickly. Now, we have Bahrain in 11 days, so we'll have to live with what we have. But Mercedes has an extremely, extremely good starting point. It's uh, basically the fourth quickest car. If we have a look here, the car is currently about fourth best. They're lacking a little bit in high speed cornering, but they have decent top speed, decent DRS decent cornering and of course they have pretty good brake cooling too although as you can see not the best but that's not actually a big issue here so the other main benefit is of course that we have hamilton who is uh you know pretty quick and we also have russell who is also very very decent so we have a top driver and a very very good driver and that does make your job a lot easier because drivers do matter quite a bit in this now when it comes to development, uh, again, if you are planning to play long term with Mercedes, a level 3 factory is basically all you need, so I wouldn't worry about upgrading this. But I probably would consider getting the team up and the race team upgraded. We're not going to be doing that because, again, this is more of a development uh, setting. I would also be upgrading the helipad for more money. And honestly, most of these are down to personal preference. Tour centers right now are very, very worth it. You should be upgrading these because, as you can see, within five weeks, this thing will gonna it's gonna make positive income. So no matter what you do, you want to upgrade that helipad. I would also always recommend, but memorabilia, weather center, hospitality, boardroom, not really necessary. The weather center you can upgrade if you want to have a little bit more, uh, you know, perfect forecasts to make your games a little bit more predictable on rainy weekends. But in this game, it's actually good enough to keep it at sixty. Keeps that a little bit of uncertainty, as I feel, which makes it more fun. So with that said, let us go into the development of the car. And the goal is going to be fairly simple. We want to develop a car that will be decent come Baku. By Baku, we want to be able to reliably win, potentially, the rest of the GPs in the year. And the way that we're going to be doing this, as I said, we have 67 days to develop the car, which is basically a little bit longer than you get at the start of the season. And that is why Baku is going to be the main goal here. The first thing we're going to develop is actually a chassis, and uh, what we're going to do here is very simple. We're going to go airflow, we're going to sacrifice engine cooling and drag reduction. But Merck does have a little bit of a problem with the engine cooling, so this could potentially backfire. But for now, we're going to go maximizing into, uh, well, the airflow, in this case, the airflow middle. Keep in mind, though, that Mercedes has the worst engine from a performance standpoint. So you are going to be a little bit lacking with your engine. It's just the way the, the game works this year. It's very minor though, so don't worry too much about it. But yeah, this is what we're going to do with the uh, chassis. It's basically a huge source of medium and high speed cornering, which is what we're going for. We are going to sacrifice top speed cornering as a result, but that's what we well do every time. And since we are going to develop with, uh, with, Bar with Baku in mind, uh, we could go ahead and just rush this one with one engineer, which is actually what we're going to do. Because what we want to do with the extra engineers is actually see if we can get two underfloors out. And we're going to do what we usually do here, which is put CFD and wind tunnel time into the underfloor. It will not be a massive game with Mercedes because of the fact that the, the way wind tunnel and CFD works, again, for CFD, 4.7, each, each 0.1 counts as a unit or a day of progress in terms of expertise. So we have 48 days plus 64 days here, uh, giving us, uh, I think it's 112. 112 days worth of expertise gain if you run it normally. And that is the big way that CFD and total time works. And it is independent of how you do things. So you can do this and rush the project. And that's actually not 
a big issue at all. And that is kind of what we're going to do here. Once again, we're going to be focusing on low speed and medium speed cornering. And as you can see here, this in in collaboration with the uh, with the uh, chassis is going to be very good already for our cornering gains. We could invest into some high speed cornering ability too. You might actually kind of want to do that. But right now, I don't think we need this. And that is why the first underfloor that we're going to make here, because we are going to make another underfloor later on. It's just going to be one focus on low speed and medium speed cornering ability. We're going to rush this one and put six engineers on it. That way we can get it done in 19 days, which means that unless we have an issue, we should be able to get two underfloors done by the time we get to Baku. And that is the whole point. Now, running rush does have a little bit of a negative effect in terms of gaining expertise, but for what we're doing here, it's actually not a big issue because the main idea behind these first projects isn't actually to gain expertise and make better parts later. It is to get the most out of the parts that we currently have uh, available to us. And what I mean by this is most of these parts have, basically once you start a save, all the parts you have are gonna be balanced. And by specializing them into what they're good at, you are gonna get quite a lot better, quite a lot of better car here. You can see already, just by specializing sidepods here. We lose a lot of top speed, yes, but we gain a lot of cornering, and cornering is kind of what we are putting a lot of our focus into. And we can have a look at how the car performs a few races in, and if we see that the top speed is a huge concern, we can sacrifice a little bit of uh, cornering speed, cornering here, in order to get that back. But for now, again, start of the season, you are gonna have parts that are really, really Poor because of the fact they aren't specialized like we are doing right now. So again, it is vital to do so if you want to get the maximum performance out of your car. And once again, we're just going to do it, I think, kind of rushed here. Sidepods don't use a lot of time anyways. So we're going to rush them, do it like this, and it should be done in 24 days. Now, the final thing that we want to do here is the suspension. And the reason why we do chassis, sidepods, underflow, and suspension first before front wing and rear wing is because of manufacturing time. Suspension, underfloor, sidepods, chassis all have a longer time to manufacture. And the front wings and rear wings just take three days each, two days if we rush them. So we can delay getting these until we get to Baku. And that's actually not a concern. So that is why we have elected to do it in that manner. Now, the reason, of course, why we've done cooling on the side pods and the suspension here is actually quite simple. Side pods are the best for engine cooling. They will give you the more way more engine cooling than the chassis can. And the same here for the suspension. It'll give you more way more brake cooling than your front wing can. So that is why we're focusing on those. Almost made a bit of an error here with minimum lifespan. I don't know why I've started to unconsciously put minimum lifespan to the maximum. But it's actually not a big issue as long as you have three to four manufacturing slots to keep the minimum lifespan at the bottom. Because the gains you get in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, performance is more than worth it and uh, i'd recommend doing this for most parts that you're going to be using so this is what we'll go for again we're just going to rush it and we're going to put one extra engineer on this project so in about 25 days we're going to have well the design project is done for most of uh, the car and then we're going to be doing another underfloor but we're also going to be trying to as i said get the uh get the rear wing, get the front wing, and get basically a completely new car come Baku. So we've gotten all the car parts development that we want to get underway underway. And next up here, we're gonna be dealing with the first three races. We have Bahrain, then we have two weeks later, Jeddah, then another two weeks, we have uh, Australia. Then we have a bit of a break, three weeks, four weeks, until we go down to uh, Baku. So in terms of development timing, we actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of leeway. So that is perfectly A-OK. -okay. Now the helipad has been upgraded. And again, I would re really recommend you upgrade this uh, This one. It's really good. Uh, the extra sponsor money can definitely, you know, have a huge effect for your team. Particularly if you don't have a lot of money. In our case, it should be fine. And I do want to have a look at the sponsor obligations here. Merchandising is great. As you see, it gives us extra income over the course of a year. Race day factory events, I don't particularly like this one because it means that you're going to be losing manufacturing capability for uh, race session days. And the factory events here, 
again, we just lose more manufacturing capabilities and it's going to slow down manufacturing. Pit crew performance here, again, I don't feel like this is worth it for just uh, basically 600,000. We're going to have a pretty shit pit crew as a result. Memorabilia room, again, this one won't matter too much, so I don't think it matters. But honestly, we don't really have any super bad events here. This one is pretty bad because, again, it's going to slow down your pit crew. Uh, the other two here, uh, although they can be bad, unless you have a lot of crashes, they shouldn't bother you too much. So we don't have too many bad sponsor obligations either. And of course, if we have a quick look at the staff here, they're all really decent, all really good. Meadows here is probably one of the best uh, sporting uh, directors you could have. And that is going to make your pit crew, uh, pit, crew, ugh, pit crew progression a lot simpler. But uh, yeah, your staff here, not really anything you need to concern yourself with. They're all really, really good. Same with the drivers. You basically have a really, really good starting point in Merc in learning the game too. So can understand why a lot of uh, people are kind of been asking for how do you actually get good with Mercedes? Now, in terms of your pit crew training, um, currently it's kind of hard to know what is a good pit crew strategy, mainly because of the fact that fatigue seems to be incredibly high, depending on how you do things. So what we're going to be focusing on for this first month is going to be basically um, pit crew stop drills rather than pit crew time. And the reason why is very simple. Pit crew stop drills, as you can see, basically the increase in wariness from doing that over the course of uh, the full day is just 1%. And as you can see, it's actually fairly effective at lowering that chance of error. We've had five sessions, we lost about half a percentage points, and that is kind of what we're going to be going with here. Personally, uh, in the initial guide, I said you could, of course, just focus paste up times. It's not necessarily wrong to do that. But if you take into consideration the fact now that um, if we say do just one gym training, uh, we're still going to end up with a lot of fatigue you can see it's now nine percent versus if we do pit stop drills it's going to be six percent so you increase it by an extra three percent a day so if you're going to do that you're going to need a little bit more rest and particularly after sessions here let's say if we do three gym training sessions in a row what are we going to be looking at then in terms of weariness of course meadows is an incredibly good uh, sporting director so you can actually push a little bit more aggressively with your gym training as Mercedes contra any other teams. So it's not necessarily a bad idea to put in a little bit extra gym training as Mercedes. But as I said, currently I would just focus on getting the pit stop drills on the way. But that is my personal, you know, personal focus. And you can also go ahead and focus the pit stop drills onto something that will be more effective. So currently we're on balance makes us that we kind of focus on everything. But if you go to the wheel gun, it'll actually be more effective in lowering the chances because the wheel gun is probably your biggest source of getting issues. So you can always go for wheel gun. And then once you maximize say wheel gun, you can start focusing on other things because as you can see, yeah, it's focused on five different stats. But as Mercedes, you can kind of mess around with the pit crew as you see fit. They're all pretty, again, the sporting director is good, which means that your pit crew has an easy time because of the way that the stats work. High lit rating, fast pick crew develop, uh, upper limit to pick crew scale, less chance of a mistake, or basically minimizing the delay from the mistakes, and fatigue. So again, Meadows here is kind of uh, insane in that regard. Now, I think we're just gonna speed along to Bahrain. We have gotten the tour center though. And once again, we can just go ahead and upgrade this. We get an increase in 25,000 a week, costs us 150,000. So within uh, six weeks, we'll have made, well, after six weeks, on the seven weeks, we'll start making profit. But let us jump into Bahrain here and we'll see how we can perform before we get any upgrades on the car. Now, in terms of performance targets here, I'd say that we're going to be able to qualify both drivers, top 10, uh, three races. The reason why I usually do this as a beginning. Uh, beginning uh, promise is incredibly simple. As Mercedes, you'll have an easy time to get in here. Money is not really that uh, tight right now. So we can do this as more of a guaranteed promise rather than take any risks. 
And we can go for fastest lap here. I think that will be doable. Reach Q3, both drivers should have no issue. And once again here, we'll just say both drivers in the top 10. It's just a lot easier to, to do this rather than push your luck and go a little bit too far. But yeah, this is basically the opening moves. We'll be going to Bahrain. Um, I have guys for basically setting up your your setups, your qualies. I will not be focusing on that. We'll be focusing on the race itself. So I'll get everything set up and then we'll jump into this first race where we don't have any upgrades and we'll have a look at our performance. Here in Sakir, and this is it, the Bahrain Grand Prix. And it's lights out, and away we go. So we want to put both of these to low and rarely defend for two reasons. The reason why we want to go to low overtake aggression is because it lowers the chance of drivers making errors. It does say that it lowers the chance of an overtake, but excuse me there. The chance of an overtake uh, 
being limited is really, really low. So basically, it doesn't have much of an effect on your overtake chances. And if you get stuck behind a car for a long time, then you can freely push this higher. But from a general point of view, keeping both of these too low and rarely defend, you can have drivers that would mostly crash every two or three races and have them have maybe two, three bad crashes over the course of a season instead, thus lowering your costs massively in terms of errors. So I would recommend keeping these on low and rarely defend for basically every race unless you have you get really stuck, you can switch your overtake aggression. You never want to use always defend. It's very, very, very situational to use this one because the way that always defend works is that, oh, it defends against overtakes. That's going to be great. I'll go a little bit slower, but yeah, I'll defend against overtakes. That's not actually how it works. Always defend means that you are actually slowing down. It's kind of you're trying to hold up the cars behind. So at Monaco, for instance, a good way to um, describe this is that by running always defend at Monaco, you'll be two to three seconds slower than the average lap base, meaning that for every lap around Monaco, you lose three seconds to the cars in front and you hold up the cars behind. And that is kind of what Always Defend does. It puts you in a bad line, which means that you use a lot of time to get through the lap. You lose a lot of time. You increase your risk of lockups and corner collisions. So unless you ha really, really need to hold up the cars behind for your teammate, I'd recommend to never use this one. Neutral, again, doesn't do much. Rarely Defend, we could get overtaken easy more easily. But if you get overtaken, it's usually because the cars behind you are either quicker or have DRS. So honestly, putting this rarely defend is again just a no-brainer. It doesn't have much of an effect on overtakes to begin with, and it does lower the risk of collisions. So just want to quickly go through this before we get any further. And I personally prefer to use ERS battle assist. It basically means that your drivers will be using ERS to attack and defend a little bit more uh, aggressively but they'll also be uh, recharging the battery when they see an opportunity. Now, some people don't like that because of the fact that, well, you'll have slower lap times while they recharge. And in general, you'll be losing a little bit of time over the course of the whole race, but it allows you to not micromanage your ERS unless you get stuck by another car for a long time. You can use deploy. And of course, you can always do deploy, neutral, top up and harvest even with this. But it basically means that for the most part, the driver will be managing ERS on their own, which means your life becomes a little bit easier. So not the best start here for us. Stroll had a better one, guessed by Hamilton, but I think Hamilton will be coming back here, I would hope. And we have Paris Leclerc on soft tires, a lot of cars on soft tires. I don't think we'll be seeing a single car on a hard tire over the course of this, uh, this race. And as you can see, Russell too, had a pretty uh, pretty horrible start, but we'll try and make the best in terms of a comeback. So once you get into the race here, again, for the first couple of laps here, everyone will be running attack, everyone will be pushing the fuel, deploying, and the reason why they do this is again, to try and get an advantage early on. And uh, they'll be doing this on basically every difficulty. I believe they might let up on easy. I'm not, I'm not completely sure. But on standard and hard, they will be attacking for the first couple of laps. And that does make your life very, very difficult unless you do the same. And over the course of the first few laps, you'll probably see some DRS uh, gaps. Basically gaps longer than a second between the cars. And once you start running low on energy, you want to kind of go neutral. Now, personally, I prefer to allow fuel to go down to one and a half uh, to two kilograms every race. Then regain it towards the end of it. We just push in the beginning. And the reason for this is twofold. Basically, uh, your fuel weight has an effect on your lap times. The less fuel in your car, the better your average lap times. So, by using a lot of fuel early, you'll be able to uh, have a little bit better race pace, basically. Now, another thing you might be worried about here is that we are running red temps. It's not actually a problem. When you are running aggressive strategies, there's just one thing you need to keep in mind, and that's actually if this uh, temperature right here goes over this one. So in this case, we still have 5 degrees of leeway before we hit 135 degrees, but you still want to keep an eye on the degradation. As long as the degradation doesn't actually exceed what is expected running attack, you will be doing a quicker strategy than if you, you know, were not running attack. And we can actually see here a little bit also in the terms that Stroll has overtaken Hamilton, uh, Russell is still struggling to just keep up with uh, Ocon, mainly because of the fact that Ocon is running soft tires for one, but he's also in a DRS room in cars in front. So that's actually kind of what we expect. 
Unfortunately, Magnuson is overtaking him with help of the RS. So Russell is struggling a little bit here. But the AI is in generally a lot more aggressive on the first 10 laps of the race. And as a result, you'll probably have a little bit of a... Uh, a little bit of a rough time but yeah generally here as i said tire heating the number is red it might look scary but as long as the degradation isn't higher than anticipated the attack strategy is going to be quicker than any other strategy just from a pure pace perspective now in terms of the ai you can actually have a look at what they're doing if you go into lap history here you can actually look at the car um condition and if we have a look at Leclerc here you can see that he's running soft tires and we can tell that he's running attack. And the way that we can actually tell that he's running attack is incredibly simple. Every tire has uh, basically, well, whenever you have a race, in this case, the medium tires has a maximum temperature of 135 before it starts to really overheat. The softs also have the same, a maximum temp of 130, hard 140. Each tire is five degrees within uh, the next one or the last one. In this case, mediums are in the middle, soft ones are uh softer so they have a maximum temp of 130 and the hards harder maximum temp of 140 and because leclerc is running five degrees below maximum temp you can actually see that he's still pushing these soft tires aggressively he's also running attack and that is something that we need to kind of keep in mind the ai is the AI will be aggressive you can see as science has started letting up he was running attack for the first four laps very very aggressively but right now he started to slow down cool his uh Pull his tires a little bit. We can see the same here from Verstappen. We can kind of see the same from Paris. He's probably running aggressive at this stage. Or even standard and just uh, cooling his tires a little bit. But for us, we're still running full attack. Because, uh, well, these two teams have better cooling than us too. So the tires will run a little bit uh, cooler as a result. In this case, I'm talking about the brake cooling. So you can use this to have a look at what the other teams are doing. You can see Stroll. Alonso, both of them are still going full attack, just as we are. And because they have a quicker car, that is why they're ahead of Hamilton, and he's kind of falling a little bit behind as a result. So, if you're wondering why you're falling backwards, you can always have a look at that, see what the other teams are doing. And if you can analyze the cars of your opponents and understand that, okay, their car is a little bit better than mine, and the drivers are on par with, my, with me, it makes sense why I'm uh, struggling a little bit to keep up. In Ocon's case, it's uh, different here. It's actually the tire, which we can also have a look at. You can do this also before races. It's probably better to do that. But you can actually head into the pre-race report and have a look at the compound performance. And what we can see here from the soft tires is that they're about eight tenths quicker on average than a medium tire. So particularly early race, you can understand that uh, Ocon on a soft tire versus us on a medium tire it's going to have a pretty significant advantage. And Bahrain is kind of special because of the fact that there's eight tenths of difference between the soft and the mediums, and the degradation difference is just four hundreds. So eight tenths split on four hundreds equals 20. So with that, we can actually see that softs are going to be better than the mediums for around 20 laps, provided they run at the same level of aggression. So if you run both on standard, they're going to be better for 20 laps, same with aggression, uh, aggressive, etc. And that is also an important thing to keep in mind. So if Ocon is running his softs on attack versus us running the mediums on attack, Ocon is going to be quite significantly quicker for basically the entire stint. And that's also why we start on the mediums. The softs are going to come back to us towards the end of the race. And that is also something you need to keep in mind with your strategies. But uh, honestly, Nothing you really should worry too much about. If you want to go more in-depth into strategy and tactics, I have a video on that too. I'll post that in the description. But this is just a general, again, info view, information that you should know when you play this game. You can also have a look at the, the time considerations, your green flag, yeah, how much time you lose under a pit stop with the virtual car, safety car. Basically, you save about four seconds if you pit under either of those. <coughs> For now, though, we're just going to sit back and relax. And honestly, again, the first stint here, you will probably be falling a little bit backwards, particularly running on uh, hard strategy. On standard, you'll probably be making a little bit of a gap. But Russell here playing around with Magnus, it isn't too bad. His confidence is going to be probably going a little bit back and forth. Same here for Hamilton. He's actually suffering because he's been falling backwards. But once we pit, we want to try and get that confidence up and running. So while running mediums is okay, it can backfire if you're unfortunate, 
But what we can also hope here is to see that Alcon, for instance, uh, calm down a little bit. But you can actually see from the from the degradation here that Verstappen is taking a chill, Sainz is taking a chill. We are pushing. Every single medium runner now is pushing. Every single soft runner, maybe with the exception of Sonoda and Gasly, are also pushing. So everyone is still very, very much going all out. Now, in this stage, you can actually just sit back, relax, speed things up a little bit, or, you know, watch it from... Uh, any uh from any of you who want watch it from first person cockpit view anything you want to do you can speed it up to 16x generally before the first pit stop it's uh there's not too much you can do because again the ai is going to be very aggressive on this first stint particularly in hard difficulty the main thing you want to just keep an eye on is going to be degradation make sure that you don't use too much fuel and as long as you have those two covered you'll usually be fine now Hamilton and Russell here are probably losing a bit of time due to the fact that we're getting held up by Ocon and Magnussen. You can of course use energy to try and create gaps. But honestly I'm not too worried about it now particularly with Hamilton and Ocon. Because again Ocon is using soft tyres. He Once they start to really fall off he's going to be pitting before us too. He'll be getting out of the way on his own. And Russell, let's be fair here, although he's running with Magnussen which isn't great. It's not a huge problem right now. And now that we see the first uh, few soft runs start pitting, we are getting into a bit of an interesting position. So, when should you pit? Is it when your tires reach 50, 50, 40, 30? Honestly, it's not actually a big issue to allow your tires to run down to 30. You'll see a little bit of a high loss of performance around the 40% mark, but generally running your tires down to 30 to make sure you can run attack is going to be in most cases more than worth it. So I'd recommend just sticking with your strategy, even if you see others pitting. But do keep in mind that undercutting, which is pitting earlier than everyone else in order to, uh, you know, gain time on fresher tires, can be extremely valuable and an extremely good strategy to use. Now, Russell here is uh, currently up into six, but uh, ahead of him we have Paris. And that's actually good because now we can actually use Paris as a bit of a pulley. And if we really wanted to here, we could potentially use Hamilton to slow him down. But we don't really, well, want to do that. We still just want to keep on doing our own race until we get to the pit window. And one of the things I would really recommend you figure out early is who are we going to be fighting. In our case, we're going to be fighting Alonso and Stroll for the most part. They pit on soft tires, we're going to do the same. We are going to come out behind them because of the fact that they pitted earlier. But towards the end of this race, Alonso and Stroll are the ones that we want to be fighting. Potentially Ocon and Gasly if, you know, we have some incidents. But we're not fighting Paris, we're not fighting Leclerc, we're not fighting the Red Bulls or the Ferraris yet. So, we don't really care what they're doing. We'll let them do their own thing, and that's not actually a an issue at all. And... Particularly early on, you might think that, oh, I'm in a great chance there to cause some problems for Ferrari. But if you do, if you do, you know, go for causing problems for Ferrari, you might be throwing away your chance at fighting Alonso, fighting Stroll. And as you see here, they're on fresh softs. They've already caught up to us. They were just four seconds. Uh, Hamilton was just four or five seconds behind them. And now they're basically about to catch him. And the reason for this is incredibly simple again. They've been doing a, uh, a full lap here. Well, they pitted earlier, and the softs just aren't that much quicker. In this case, they're running about two seconds quicker than us. Of course, that might be a concern, but once we now pit, we're going to go onto the soft tire, and we're going to go onto the soft tire for both cars till the end, and we're going to be running attack. So we should be getting this time back, and because we went long on the mediums, when we're going to come out, remember it was 23 seconds, so we might be beat Gasly out here for Hamilton, that's what we're going to hope for. As it's Magnus and Ocon, none of them are in the DRS train. Hamilton with superior car, superior tyres, should have no problems just overtaking them. And it's going to be the same here for Russell. Probably going to come out uh, behind Hulkenberg. But because we have, again, better tyres, better car, we should have no problem overtaking. And as we build confidence as a result, confidence is pretty low right now, we'll get some more stats back, we'll lower the chance of an incident. But as you can see here, qualifying higher and going long might actually be pretty bad um, on a hard difficulty. This is going to work better on standard and easy. You might want to just start on potentially a soft here 
in order to make your life a little bit easier. But uh, this is what we've decided to do here. We might try something different at Jeddah. So here we go. First pit stop. It is kind of risky to pit them this close in case we have an error. But looks like we kind of timed it okay here. Hamilton gets out just barely ahead of Gasly. Russell gets out ahead of Hulkenberg. Which is kind of what we were hoping for. And for now, they just need to get those tires up to temperature. And then they can start hunting down the cars ahead. So honestly... Not the best pit uh, window ever, but we did pit into a little bit of free air, no DRS trains, and now we can start chasing down Stroll and Alonso. So we'll speed time up here a little bit. We'll be focusing a little bit here now at the first uh, race, if you will. And as you can see, Gasly is kind of keeping up with us, and that is a little bit of a concern, but uh, as long as he doesn't overtake us, it's not actually gonna be an issue. Now Hamilton has actually caught up at this point, and this is where we want, might want to deploy, particularly at this, uh, once you have pitted. Because if you, the laps after you pitted are the laps where your tires are going to be at their best. It's going to be the best chance you get for doing overtakes. It's going to be the best chance you get at the catching the car in front. And that is kind of what we're going for here. You also might want to just keep on deploying in order to create gaps to the car behind. In this case, we're trying to leave Magnussen behind and create a bit of gap here to make life a little bit easier for... Um, Russell is going to need to do the same things that we are doing. And we can actually see that Hamilton's tires are running a little bit hot, but honestly not hot enough for us to be in trouble. So we'll tune him down now. He needs to get an overtake done on Ocon, and he should be able to do so with a little bit of uh, DRS here. And if he can't, we'll just try and get it done here. So we're going to go deploy again, make sure that we stay close into the corner, and he should just fly by now. And he does. And with this, we can kind of now start chasing down Stroll. But we don't have energy, probably won't be able to leave Ockham behind in the short term. And if you want to, we're going to have to probably sit back and recharge energy to get that done. But for the time being, it's okay to just leave things as they are. Now, Russell is also getting closer, but he has a little bit of a problem ahead of him here, Magnuson and Gasly. And when you have to deal with DRS strains, that is when you are going to struggle a little bit because Magnuson here has DRS. And that is making making an overtake particularly difficult. But with a little bit of energy there, we can still make it happen. And now we should have no problem getting Ghastly here. Well, he actually got him quicker than I anticipated. So as you can see, it is working fairly well. And we don't really have anything to worry too much about. Russell here is going to now try and deploy, get away from gas, so we want to create gaps again, because we are going to be pitting once more, so we do not want any of these teams to be, you know, running with us for anything, you know, for any longer than they need to. The bigger the gap, the better for us uh, later on. And once you've actually left them behind, like we have here, more than one second, you can tune down the energy usage again, start saving it for the future. Hamilton on his side has actually caught up here to uh, Stroll. And what we're going to do is actually just start a little bit of harvesting because we can't really leave Stroll behind at the moment. He's also going to be pitting again. But this does prove that we're probably going to be able to get Stroll by the end of this race because Stroll's going to pit again and we're also going to pit again. And currently we have already caught him up, caught up to him about halfway through this stint. So that is very, very promising. Now, the reason why we're recharging Hamilton here is because we want to have enough energy so that when we actually pit, we can pull ahead of Stroll enough that he is gonna, sorry, then when we pit, once we overtake him, we can pull away from Stroll enough that he will not be able to stay with us. That's gonna be the goal here. If we do not give Stroll DRS, we can open up a gap uh, because we are now currently on the better tire, which will make it easier to overtake him later on when we do pit again. And we could do the same here for Russell because Ocon has apparently caught up with us again. So that's not, uh, that's not optimal. <laughs> so we'll do the same. But again, we need to remember who our fight is with. It's with Aston. It is with Alpine for these first few races. So uh, if Sainz ends up pulling Ocon back with us, which is probably what actually happened here, uh, well, it sucks. It's just something we're going to have to uh, to accept. Now we're going to speed along here to the final pit stops. There's not really much else we can do at this point other than just wait. And that is exactly what we will do. So... We'll speed along here till the final pit stop. As I said, Sainz here isn't our fight, but we can use him to just try and stay with him. But again, you would, you shouldn't, you know, force yourself to do so. It's not going to benefit you in any way, shape, or form if you use energy or tire 
to stay with a card that you can't beat. You can use him to, you know, get a little bit of a boost for a couple laps, but I wouldn't use it for anything more than that. Now, Stroll here should be pitting within a lap or two, but Russell doesn't really have any energy, so we'll just leave him be as it is. Even if uh, Stroll runs with Russell, that's fine. And as I said, we probably aren't going to be able to, by the end of this race, maybe jump Stroll with both cars. That's going to be the goal. But we're definitely going to need to run these uh, soft tires into the ground. We're kind of doing that with the Hamilton at, Hamilton at the moment. You can see that the degradation is quite high. And both Alonso and Stroll did pit now, so... We'll have to see if we can gain, catch them, but I think as I said that Hamilton is going to be catching Stroll, same with Russell, but we will not be catching Alonso. So currently our fight for both of our Mercedes drivers is with Stroll rather than Alonso because Alonso has just pitted and he's already with us. Unless we say sacrifice uh, Russell a little bit here in order to hold, uh, hold him up. Now, Hamilton here, we're going to do one more lap for both of our drivers, which isn't probably very good. We're going to go below 30%, and this is when you really start to lose time. And your lap times are going to be longer, but unless you hit 20%, you should be fine in terms of punctures. And you can actually see just how much slower we are right now, because we, we, we're we losing behind Sainz here now quite a bit. So... Is it a good idea to do this? Probably not. We probably should have pitted and just ran a couple laps on aggressive to make sure that we had enough tire. But we opted to take a little bit of a risk here. And can we come out ahead of Stroll? Probably with Hamilton. But for Russell, it's going to be a little bit of a more difficult uh, affair. But Russell is going to probably be able to catch Stroll by the end of this. And the main reason is because Stroll is already on used soft tires. So currently, I say we are in a very good position to where we want to be. For Hamilton, it's just push now, create the gap to Stroll, keep that gap going. And for Russell, it's try and catch Stroll before the end of this race. And that is basically where you're at with Mercedes for your first few races until you get an upgrade. You'll be fighting for 7th, 6th, 6th, 7th, 8th, maybe 5th, depending on how the races go. But that is generally just where you're going to be at. And it is important to accept that fact that my car and my drivers compared to the rest of the grid that is the best that we can achieve right now and that is what we should be focusing on at the start of races of course incidents can happen with safety cars red flags uh you know things that are kind of outside of your control that can change this but it is quite important to understand what is my what is my skill ceiling well not skill ceiling what is the uh what is the expected result in a race weekend where nothing happens. As you see right now, Stroll is getting caught by Russell. We gained six tenths that last lap, so that is good. And once we actually catch up to Stroll here, we're going to go aggressive for a few laps. Because again, Russell's fight is with Stroll. No way that we're catching anyone ahead of us unless they have an incident. So we're going to be... We're going to be a little bit realistic here. And we're going to recharge. We're going to run aggressive, cool the tires, save them a little bit. Maybe even standard can make it work here, as you can see. Because the main thing that we want to do now is just recharge back to 100% energy. And once we've done that, which we actually did just now, we'll turn back up to aggressive. We'll go neutral. And we'll also just go a little bit conserve here. Just a little bit. Uh, we're going to do the same for Hamilton, just to make sure that we actually get down to zero before the end of this race. For Russell now, we're going to deploy... And we're going to gamble on the fact that we have enough energy and enough push here to actually get away from Stroll before we get to this direction, DR, DRS detection point. And if we do so, we should be able to create a bit of a gap. Now, we were lucky in this case because we had Sergeant with us who held up uh, Russell. He's getting lapped, so he's going to be a little bit slow and getting out of the way. And that is beautiful for us. And Russell now has created a bit of a gap to Stroll. He's up into 7th. And Hamilton is actually gaining on the cars ahead quite significantly. It's gaining two seconds a lap. So Sainz might potentially be within our grasp. And that is an interesting interesting thing to, to note here. Sainz could potentially be caught because, one, his tires are basically done for. He's gambled on a one-stop. And that is going to be a little bit of an interesting end to this because usually we wouldn't be able to fight a ferrari but the ferrari has been uh, a ferrari gone for a one stop 
and that has given us a pretty significant tire advantage here towards the end. However, will we be able to catch him? That is a little bit harder to, to say, really. But if we use everything that we can, then it's not impossible. But I think Science right now is actually getting DRS from, you know, running behind back markers. And that is actually causing us a little bit of a concern in terms of getting that done. We've also been running Russell a little bit too long here in conserve, but that's not a big deal. Um, it doesn't change his outcome. But particularly running push and having too little fuel to get over the line is a bit of a bit of a bigger concern here but yeah right now uh, we're just running a tad too slow here to actually catch signs and he, he has about enough tire to make it till the end so if we want to get him we're gonna have to get within drs and to get within drs that right now i've decided to deploy we might get drs right now though and we did with the help of uh with the help of bodas and that allowed us to catch up quite a bit. But I don't think it is going to be enough, unfortunately, uh, to make it to the end of this. Basically, I have two laps to make this work. And while it's a bit unfortunate, maybe if we pushed earlier, we could have made it happen. But I wanna, that is one of those things that uh, if I had a little bit better, you know, foresight, had a little bit look on the pit stops, on science tires, we might have been able to make it work. But he will actually hit below 30% right now. So what I'm thinking is that we're just going to push. We're going to put this to deploy. Give everything that we can over the course of this lap. And we'll just try and see if we can get within DRS. Come this corner right here. And unfortunately we couldn't. And that is probably, unfortunately, the best that we could hope for. Paris wins the race though, which is interesting. And I'm wondering here. Is Hamilton going to be able to maybe do something with DRS? Probably not. We're probably lacking a little bit uh, right there. But it is a very good start here for us. 6th and 7th. While not perfect, it is basically what you can expect before you get your upgrades. And this is probably what we're going to be seeing. That is probably what we're going to be seeing for the first 6 or 7. Sorry, not 6 or 7. The first three races until we get to Baku and get all the upgrades. We could also see some better results in Australia because, well, Australia will have some of the upgrades. But yeah, six or seven would be good. Unfortunately, we couldn't get signs. We were close. And again, this is probably an error on my part. We probably could have gotten signs if we'd gone a little bit more aggressive, but that is not a big deal. So for now, we are going to speed things along. Uh, we might just skip Jeddah because I want to keep this in one video. Probably have focused a little bit too much on this race, but that should honestly be fine. And we've gone, gone over most things you need to think about in terms of strategy. And for Jeddah, we're going to go over a minor other thing. Um, basically, the fact that Jeddah, the way the Jeddah works is that it's a rather hot track, so degradation will usually be higher than anticipated. So we'll go over the scenario, what you can do in that situation there. Now, we actually have a second ATR period starting. And that is also something we need to take into consideration because ATR is a huge boost in terms of your car stats. And we actually have the first assignments done here, the underfloor. And I want us to take a little bit of a look in the warehouse on this underfloor. And as you can see here, it gives about 45, 61 in terms of cornering boost. And if we go ahead and assign another one, let us see what that gives us in terms of boosts, provided, of course, that we run the same sliders. So this is a significant uh, significant gain, not really in low speed and medium speed cornering, but generally across the board, because that previous one would lose us a lot of speed. It would lose us some dirty air tolerance, but because of the CFD and wind tunnel time that we put into it, this one's actually a significant boost in, the, for the most part, the other stats than the ones we invested in because if the end wind tunnel time seems to be applied basically more balanced. Now we could also go ahead here and do this. As you see, we get a lot of high speed and compared to the stats that we have on that previous underfloor, we do lose a little bit of low speed. Uh, we actually gain a little bit of medium speed and we do lose still a little bit of dirty air, a little bit of top speed. But this would give us a car that is unbeatable in the high speed cornering department. It would keep fix the medium speed, would do a little bit for low speed. And we still have that uh, front wing to make which is also going to be front low speed dependent so we're going to make a cornering 
balanced underfloor, which basically focuses on all three. I think that is our best bet. And what we're going to do here is rush it again, put six engineers on it. Although we want it for Baku, so we just need to get it done 28 days in advance. 29 days works too, I would think. Because we just need to get two underfloors made before Baku. So we're just going to rush it with one engineer. And what we're going to do here is actually use uh, the engineers for something else. Once this chassis is done, we're going to be start to start to make that front wing. And once the signposts are done, we're going to be making a rear wing. So we're going to be spreading the engineers that we have available on those two projects. Now, we could, of course, also manufacture. Well, we can't actually because we have a sponsor <laughs> obligation. We could manufacture that underfloor and have it ready for... Have it ready for... Uh, um, Australia. And that's probably what we're going to do. But for now, we're just going to allow one day to pass. The sign has been completed on the chassis. And... The chassis we are going to manufacture, because we're probably not going to be making another chassis in the near future. It is going to hurt the engine cooling, but that's fine. Engine cooling is mainly your ability to... Uh, to uh, Basically, it has to do with the, the uh, durability of parts on your, your powertrain. Your engine, your gearbox, your ARS. The higher your engine cooling, the slower the, they degrade. The lower your engine cooling, the quicker they degrade, the more replacements you're going to need. So engine cooling is quite important from that perspective. Now, as you can see, I did say that I didn't like the manufacturing things that we had, and this is the main reason. It takes about nine days to make a chassis, but because of the fact that we, well, eight days, really seven days, um, I think it is, but because of the restrictions that we have in manufacturing from our sponsor obligations, it's going to take us 22 days. So if we rush it, it's going to cut it down by more than half, and we'd have it ready for Melbourne. So. What I'm thinking here, we're actually going to rush a couple of chassis. Generally, I don't recommend doing this. And honestly, we probably will not have to do this for this save because we are going to be probably dominating pretty, pretty uh, decisively come back. But we're going to rush it just so we can have it ready for um, Australia. We're also going to be making two more underfloors. And we're just going to be making two of these basically as a bit of a stopgap. They're nice to have, basically, if we need to. We can go back to those later, so we're going to go ahead and manufacture those as well. Now, I did say that we were going to make a front wing and a rear wing, so we'll just get started on the front wing here. And what we're going to do is actually push CFD and wind tunnel hours into this front wing. Now, probably rather than the front wing, a better alternative might be your suspension. But if you're going to use CFD time, I'd recommend use it first in your underfloor, then on your uh, suspension or front wing, and then your suspension or front wing. Use it on those three first. And the main reason for that is you usually will be struggling with low speed cornering rather than anything else in the long run. And that is why we want to focus on the front wing and of course also the suspension because it gives both of those. And this is basically what I would like to set up with the front wing. We could of course, as you can see, get a decent amount of high speed uh, tolerance here, but we'd lose a lot of dirty air tolerance, which is basically how good our cars are falling behind other cars. We're also losing a lot of brake cooling if we do like this. So. The main way is that basically the more sliders you put to the right, the more of the stats you lose. So we're going to lose a little bit of high speed here with this front wing. We could also, of course, go completely into low speed cornering, which probably wouldn't be the worst idea here, honestly. And it would also allow us to alleviate the loss of brake cooling and dirty air tolerance. So you basically need to make decisions here on what you want to do. But this one, because we know we're going to make another front wing after this, we're just going to focus on making a low speed cornering one, which is just two sliders maximized and a little bit of sacrifice on the rest because of the fact, again, we are putting in CFD time. So we are for sure going to be making another one in the near future. And because we want this done by Baku, you can actually see that we don't actually need to put any engineers on this because we'll have it done in 30 days. But also because we are doing a uh, another one, we can do it maximum rush. And with that, we can actually get two front wings and two underfloors done before Baku, and that's kind of what we're hoping for. Now, in four days, we should have the sideboard project and, of course, the suspension, which is going to help with cooling. And we're also going to be starting that rear wing project very, very soon. So let us go ahead and speed along until we get the next one. Tall center has been upgraded. Again, you can upgrade that as you see fit, but uh, level two is good enough for me. And with the sideboard here, we are going to go ahead and, of course, just manufacture them normally. Now, with this, we're not going to get them done for Melbourne. We could, of course, rush them again. 
which I think we will do because it just makes more sense that way. We do have a lot of cost cap to go up. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> I wouldn't really recommend doing this in any other part of the season, but at the start of the season, it's fine to do a little bit of rushed uh, design projects, a little bit of rushed manufacturing, and then just keep it to standard for the rest of the year. And I'll be going over that towards the end of the video, why you'd like to keep it on standard. For now though, we'll get started on that final project of ours, the rear wing. And for the rear wing, we basically just want to focus on two things, DRS Delta and drag reduction. And the main reason is that we are sacrificing a lot, and I mean a lot of top speed with the cornering strategies that we are doing. And with the main way that we're going to get that top speed back is going to be through the rear wing. And even that, it will not be enough. But it does help to get us back into, you know, somewhat acceptable ranges. But mainly the thing that we want is the DRS effectiveness. And... The more that we focus on one stat, the better it is in terms of the RS effectiveness. But you can also, of course, if you really need to, uh, let's say we're lacking low speed here. Let's say that we're lacking medium speed. You can also focus one cornering, uh, you know, one cornering ability as well. But the trade-off is that you're going to lose a lot more dirty air. And this one is kind of important because, again, it has with following. So losing a lot of dirty air isn't really recommended. But... Uh, we might have to maybe get this back through the underfloor, to the front wing, to the rear wing. Later on, we might need to make pass where we get some dirty air tolerance recovered. But for now, this should be probably enough as a rear wing. We'll get it done in with a rushed approach. And that should have every single part ready now, potentially, come Baku. We also have a suspension done in a day, which is good. So let's go ahead and get that suspension uh, underway as well. Helipad, we're of course going to maximize it. Again, sponsor goals give us a lot of money. And for the suspension, if we can, we would definitely like to get it done by Melbourne. So we're going to go ahead and rush it again. It is, again, not super recommended, but for the first pass there, you can do it. And it's not going to be a big issue. And we are going to have four new parts come Melbourne, which is going to mean that we're going to be somewhat competitive already in Australia. Now, once you've done what we've done here, we basically end up with a slot that we don't really know what to do with. And what I like to do here is just start working on improving stats. So in this case, we have UCFD time on the front wing, the underfloor. The next thing is going to be the suspension. So we can focus side pod. We can focus chassis at this point, honestly. Personally, I'd probably focus a little bit on the chassis. And what I mean by this is just doing a couple of design projects that are the opposite of what we've been doing. Now, we're going to be making this design, but we're not going to be manufacturing it. And the reason why we're making this design is purely for expertise game. It's basically like doing research before research unlocks. By doing this, we're going to be increasing our drag reduction and energy cooling expertise on this chassis design with small gains on the airflow middle. Basically, what we are going to be doing is uh, alleviating the weaknesses that we created with the initial chassis design, which was the loss of the, uh, well, top speed velocity the acceleration, and also the engine cooling. And after we run this project once or twice, we'll be making a new cornering uh, chassis that we intend to manufacture. And it should be a lot better in terms of that those two weaknesses. And again, we're not intending to use this chassis, so that is why we're making it like we are. This project will run on normal. And the reason is simple. The longer a project runs, the more expertise you're gonna gain. So running a project on normal with one engineer it's going to be your best expertise to money ratio. It's going to be the most efficient use of your money to gain expertise. We can run it on intense, but intense would give us one and a half times expertise gain for three times the cost. Not really cost effective. And it's perfectly fine to run a few intense projects in the beginning of the season. Um, but it does, you know, cause you a little bit of risk in terms of running out of cost cap. So personally, I prefer to avoid using intense, but start in teams where you're lacking, uh, where you're starting with lower expertise, it can be really effective because again, expertise gain is slows down the higher it gets. But for us, we're just going to run the project on normal because again, what we're looking at here is expertise gain, not a part that we're going to put on the car. Now with this asset, we're going to go through Jeddah here pretty quick. And the reason why we're going to go through Jeddah pretty quick is because we don't have any uh, any big car pieces yet. We don't have any upgrades. We'll get those in Australia and then in Bahrain. So we're going to just uh, 
again, speed to Jeddah, we're probably going to end up 6th, 7th, 8th again. But I will be talking about the degradation being higher than expected here. So we'll have a look at that in just a second. So this is the situation I want to talk about, and that's something that commonly happens in Cheddar, and that is that you've pushed a little bit too hard, and now your ties have ended up below the expected degradation limit. Now, usually what you do is you usually catch this fairly early and tune down to, say, aggressive or standard. But in our scenario here, let's say that you haven't caught it early and you're in my current situation, and this is probably going to mess up your strategy a little bit. So... For the purpose of this, we've done soft here just to make sure that we can actually destroy the ties. And as you can see here, we've run attack. Degradation has been higher than anticipated. And the main reason for that is actually because the track is very hot and also because it's very hot in terms of an air temperature. So you can have a look at this at start of races and then have a look at your temps a few laps in, see if you can expect this problem and then make your decisions accordingly. Now, once you get into this position, you're gonna be in a little bit of trouble because well, degradation is higher than anticipated, how do I deal with that? Well, for starters, you're probably going to have to pay it earlier, and you're probably also going to have to, you know, make your second stint in this case, uh, sorry, the third stint here, a little bit different because of the high temperatures. So with this, we've already lost five seconds, but we actually lost more because of the fact that A, we're going to need to pit earlier, and also because this stint has gone way slower than anticipated because we're having higher dag, meaning that our average lap times are lower than what is anticipated from the planner. So this is probably what you'd have to do to fix it. You're going to have to run lighter to try and see if the dag if the is still high here, we're going to have to let go even more. Same here for the hards, but as a general rule of thumb, the hards rarely, if ever, see higher degradation than anticipated. You're going to have pretty need pretty low smoothness for that. So there's probably a pretty decent fix. Now, of course, if you're running a super aggressive strategy here, let's say that you were planning to do something like this, you definitely have to probably just give up on this medium stint altogether. And what you probably might have to do instead is just keep on going full attack on the mediums. They're still going to degrade pretty quick, but you'll probably be ending up with something like this instead to kind of compensate. And as you can see, it is a tad slower than running the hard. So... Keep in mind that you, you might have to change the strategies on the fly if you're running too aggressive and that can be a bit of a problem, but it will be fine in most cases. It's uh, it's an error that you for the most part just make once, but I thought it might be important here because we are doing a little bit of a domination guide that, uh, you know, it's something you need to keep in mind of. So we just finished Jetta and it kind of went as expected. Uh, with 7th and 8th, even though we did kind of uh, a soft high test. Probably could have gone 6th if we hadn't, but honestly, for the first couple of races here, this is kind of where we expect to be, um, honestly. And now that we actually have gotten to a point where we're going to be getting some upgrades, that is probably going to change pretty drastically. And that is kind of what we're going to have a little bit of a look at now before we go into, into the Australian Grand Prix. We do have a bit of a wind tunnel uh, data concern though, and this is a bit of a problem because it's going to slow down all of our design projects by six days. Now, currently our design projects are going to be done in uh, basically 20 days, 25 days is the one that we are most worried about. And if we have a look now on how long is it actually until we go to Baku, 28 days plus uh, 28 plus basically this. so. 38 days and if we have a look then at the development we can actually slow down we can we can accept this issue the main problem is going to be manufacturing the underfloors in time if we do this because well we need time to get that done um and of course the front wing is also going to be a bit of an issue then in getting both projects done so this is the, this is the kind of thing we were a little bit concerned about now six days might not sound like a you know a huge amount but if you're trying to get something done in time for a race, in particular here, we're trying to get it done in time for Baku, um, you are going to be time, kind of limited. We have 32 days, I think, no? We have 39 days then. Okay. 39 days. That's just me being silly. April 28th, 32 days into the forecast, 39 days. So we have 39 days to go on, and... 
Yeah, we're not going to get the second prime wing. We're not going to get the underforce in time. If we slow it down by six days. So, this is where we take a bit of a gamble. And the gamble comes in form of... Do you accept this data concern? We can deny investigation chance of problem worsening. Usually you'll have to take a two to three times as bad penalty as a result. Or do we approve the investigation? Now in this case we can, if we rush, probably still make it work, I think. Particularly for the underfloor. Shouldn't be an issue. The front wing is going to be a little bit of a concern, but I still think we can make it make it happen here. So rather than taking the chance, we're going to go ahead and approve the investigation. And that's kind of the... That will be up to each person, how they want to do this. But in my case, we're just going to go ahead and approve it just to make our life a little bit more, well, easier. Now, we have manufactured the chassis, and what we're going to do here actually now is going to go ahead and manufacture another one because we're going to need spares. And as you can see, it's going to take 13 days. Um, and we'll just go ahead and manufacture that one normally. That should be still okay. And the wind tunnel data concern here did indeed discover a fault that could have escalated over time. So in this case, we actually did pick the correct choice, but of course, if there was no fault, then it wouldn't have been an issue. But cutting off six days here was probably the better choice rather than having to wait far longer than if we, well, didn't do that. So while, you know, while it sucks, there is just no way around it. And we're gonna be fine with just having two underfloors, I think. Side pods, on the other hand, we're going to go ahead and manufacture one more of those just to be on the safe side. And uh, again, you kind of want to have four of every part with the exception of front wings. I'd say I have six of those, but I, I like to have four of every part in, in store. But of course, that's going to be difficult to achieve, particularly early on in the season. With that said, we'll go ahead and make another suspension. And now I want to have a look at what the car is actually like, because now we actually got those four new parts, the chassis the side pods and the underfloors of course we can get new underfloors and we're gonna get suspension zones so with those four new parts here our car is currently pretty dominant in the cornering department it's also apparently incredibly dominant in brake cooling and the engine cooling so already the car is looking a lot better we are still a bit concerned about dirty air tolerance but right now we could potentially start doing a little bit of domination because we have a pretty significant gain on most of these parts or most of these stats already. But there is important to keep in mind that we are really far behind now in the top speed department. That isn't really a concern though, because cornering is king in this game. And as long as you have a very good cornering car, your top speed doesn't matter much. Helipad has been upgraded to its maximum level. We can be happy with that. That's 5% extra response to targets payout. And I'm very curious now on how we're actually going to perform here in uh, Australia. So we'll go for fast slap. We'll go ahead and save both cars in Q2 and Q3. And as I said, we have a new underfloor. That is going to be a second edition. We have the front wing, which we're going to make two editions of. And we also have the rear wing. So we technically still have three more upgrades incoming. And we'll have a look and see how that looks at Baku. But for now, we're going to do Australia. And we're going to see if the car is probably now more than able to fight for podiums, or if we might be able to even beat the Red Bulls, and more importantly, beat Verstappen. So let's see where we're at once we're done with the Australian, uh, not GP, qualification. All right, so not the best quality we could have had, but considering the uh, differences here from 6th to 2nd, I'd say it's acceptable. It's within a 10th, <laughs> basically a top, uh, well, 2nd to 6th, with the exception of Paris here are all within a tent of each other, so I'd say we are far more competitive than we were uh, just a couple of races ago, which is not that surprising. And with that, we are going to be going with a fairly aggressive strategy around here, but uh, it's nothing too really special. We'll just be going with the good old, well, push and attack, and that is generally what we are going to be, you know, pulling off. So again, aggressive strategy is going to be the cornerstone of basically everything you do uh, if you want to follow what we've done here so far. And for this one, we're just going to do a very, very standard, uh, if you will, medium to hard to a soft tire. Now you could potentially go with something a little bit more aggressive, which sounds weird when I say it like that, but we can actually do something like this where we do either soft or medium to start, then we go on to a medium and then we go into a soft towards the end 
But as you can see, it's going to be slower than a strategy where you go full on attack. So we're going to be doing this, start on medium, go into hard, go into soft. It's going to be the quick strategy available to us. And we'll see if we can actually make our way up the, the grid with that. I think we can. I still think we're on for a podium here. So that is what we're going for. Let's see towards the end. And again, we'll be skipping most of this race because there's nothing really new here in terms of strategy. And we want to see probably more how we perform come Baku. So currently this is going fairly well for Hamilton. We have uh, made our way up to, well, Verstappen. We have a few laps here to go. And uh, we have a bit of a tire advantage. So uh, I'd say so far this uh, strategy has been working out pretty well for us. Russell has had a miserable race though. He's had a couple of spins which has put him out of contention. But Hamilton here is kind of proving that the car so far has had developments that have put it to the forefront. Now, the main reason why, uh, well, the car is at the forefront right now is a, a, we have done a lot of development in a short amount of time, and B, the AI is probably not aggressive with development as we are. So we'll be seeing them coming back towards this, towards the, towards Baku, basically, as they'll have the first four sets of developments. Russell here, if I put a little bit more effort into him, probably would have gotten up to fifth. Was focused a little bit too on uh, Hamilton here. But as you can see, you can actually make a fairly dominant car fairly quick. And again, once we get the next three upgrades, which is going to be the front wing, the underfloor, and the rear wing, we're probably going to be even more dominant come Baku. And that's kind of going to be the, uh, the play here. So with that in mind, let's just jump ahead and get things done. As you can see that uh, Russell also had a bit of a problem with, uh, well, pit stops. And uh, yeah. That did not help his chances. But this does put us into a wonderful position now where we are kind of dominant. So let's see here. Next month here, we're starting with April. Russell has a bit of an improvement, which is good. And other than that, nothing really much to say. In terms of the pit crew uh, training here, we're kind of going to stick with what we were doing earlier, which is going to be pit stop errors for the most part. But we are also going to want to work on uh, everything else. And you kind of want to try and keep your crew working when they are, for the most part, actually, uh, well, not into the tired status. So we're going to rest a couple of days here before we start actually doing any training. And that should help us with getting into the well rested stage and keep the well rested stage running for most of this, uh, most of this training, as it will be more beneficial that way. And we do want to do a little bit of gym. But generally, as I've said here, the main goal is going to be to get that error chance down more so than anything else. Because, well, you'll end up losing more time over the course of the season from errors than you will do from just having a few tens longer pit stops. And that is kind of the philosophy behind what we're doing here. Focusing on the chance of mistake. And once again, we can go ahead and put that to the wheel gun. Lowers it massively. And again, we've almost got the wheel gun maxed. After that, I'll probably start working on uh, car release and jacks. But this definitely is going to help save us time in the long run. Although, already we've seen Russell suffer for it. Chassis has been manufactured. The sign pod has been manufactured. But that isn't actually the, the main thing here. The first designer is done. And as I said, what we want to do now with this front wing design is actually immediately start making a new one. And... We have 21 days to get this done, so let's be honest here. Because of the CFD limit that we hit last time around, we're not going to be able to make a new front wing in time, which is going to be, of course, a little bit unfortunate, but it's probably going to just have to be a uh, uh, something that we're going to have to just eat, if you will, a bit of an error there. We're going to focus on low speed and medium speed cornering for this front wing. I think it's going to be worth it. We could, of course, also just go full on into the low speed uh, focus, which probably isn't actually a terrible idea. Uh, but I think it's better for us to actually put in a little bit of uh, medium speed here on the front wing as well. So this is what we go for. Even if we rush it, even if we put it all the engineers here, we'll only get it done in 20 days. So we could emergency manufacture it for Baku just to see the comparison. But we'll do this because, well, I want to get it done as quickly as possible. And we're also going to go ahead and manufacture three front wings because, well, we're going to need these for the race anyways. So let's get them out there. There's nothing 
again, else that we really can do. And it'll give us a way to, you know, compare that Brombwing to the uh, the new boosted one directly. So we're still going to have a Brombwing upgrade, but we're not going to have the maximum upgrade, if that makes sense. Red Wing, Underfloor, 8 days, 13 days, and that should be good. We're also getting a Regulation Boat change here. Uh, regulation Boat, and in this case, High Speed or Low Speed Wing Changes. And these actually have a fairly big uh, effect on this, because, well... This is cornering. The RS Delta is uh, not as huge. I'd be more worried about this one, honestly, rather than this one. So we're going to go for high speed wing changes. And again, research is uh, going to be something we'll have to deal with once we get there. For now, though, we're going to go ahead and manufacture this underfloor. And we're going to go ahead and make two of them. We're going to rush them so we can have them for Baku. Again, kind of, uh, kind of a little bit of waste of money there, but that's fine. And since the only other thing that we're going to be getting here now is going to be a uh, those rare wings, we can actually go ahead and manufacture an extra chassis. We can go ahead and manufacture extra suspensions. Those are usually the ones that fail first, and then you have your sideboard and your underfloor. So that should be good with us keeping, keeping up with things, if you will. Now, we're also going to go ahead and do a design here for the sideboard. We'll be doing the same as we're doing for the chassis. We'll be focusing on something else. Now, generally, FLO front is not going to have a huge effect on your sideboard, no matter what you do. As you can see here, the difference between this is 0 0.14 G, so probably not worth it. But the FLO middle is going to be in the long run. So we'll go ahead and invest in that. And as you can see, we're getting a lot of KPH. We're losing a lot of engine cooling. But we're not going to be manufacturing this. We're just doing it normally to get expertise. And we now know that any um, anything that happens this year in terms of research is going to be limited to the front and the rear wing. So doing anything in terms of design with the other four parts is perfectly viable. So that is why we're doing it. Front wing has been manufactured, which is so good. And the research period has begun. We are going to get high speed wing changes. And with that, we're going to have to focus a little bit on DRS Delta but also the high, medium, and low speed uh, on the front wing, which honestly isn't too bad. We mainly are going for low and medium speed on front wing anyways, and the rear wing, we're not really focusing on cornering abilities, so that is fine from a research perspective too. Most sponsorship obligations, I usually deny these because they just aren't worth it in my opinion. And in terms of the rear wing here, we're going to go ahead and manufacture that, and we need to get it done in time for the race. Two should be fine. But we can just start manufacturing four because we aren't really going to be making any new rear wings in the near future. Because, well, for one, we are having regulation changes that are hitting the rear wing. So if we're going to be focusing any of the signs, we'd probably be doing suspension. We kind of want to do the same here that we're doing for everything else. Where we are kind of focusing what we are, well, losing for the most part. So we do something like this. High speed isn't really something you need to really focus on this part, but it's always beneficial. And we'll just do a normal design. We could, of course, start doing research, and this is basically where you have to make a decision if you want to do research or not. But I think we're going to see how we perform in Baku before we make that decision. So let's go ahead here, speed along, and that should bring us a little bit closer. Chassis design is complete, and honestly, we're just going to do another uh, chassis design here. I usually like to do two or three before we make a new addition, and we're just going to do the same thing we did last time around, where we focus on the two stars that we have not been focusing on so, so far. And this will give us a pretty significant boost, but again, we don't really want to, uh, we're not really gonna be using this part, so this is fine. Do it normally, there we go. Suspension has been manufactured. Let us have a look here now at what the, what the car actually looks like on Baku. And remember, we still have a little bit of an upgrade left in the, uh, in the uh, front wing this one and we could manufacture it we could also emergency manufacture it but honestly it's not worth it for just one race so we're just gonna go ahead and make six of these in a normal manner this is gonna be the final edition front wing most likely so there's no shame in just getting that underway now because we're having mainly big changes to front wing and research i probably recommend using for the rest of the season one slot for your front wing one slot for your rear wing in terms of getting research done. And the main focus here is going to be, well, front wing. The, well, the other parts are taking, again, 30% high speed, 27% medium, 10% low speed. 
So we kind of want to focus the research on these three aspects and then just get a little bit of break cooling, the idea tolerance, airflow front as a bonus. So this is probably how we do research. And for research two, <coughs> excuse me again, for research two, we're just going to keep one engineer on the project. We're going to allow it to run for as long as possible to get the most out of our money. And doing this, you probably will not be able to reach the 30% mark. But if you put in a CFD period or two, in this case, we still have uh, four CFD periods. So if we really want to, we could put two CFD periods of research into both front wing and rear wing. We definitely make up for the uh, for the loss, more or less. Now we're finally at Baku. Let us have a look at what the car will be looking like. The new chassis again, we're not going to be using that. Of course not. The front wing. We're going to be putting this on and if we compare it to the other front wing here as you can see we're getting a huge amount of medium speed cornering because this one is mainly focused on low speed cornering but this one is a pretty decent upgrade all across the board dirty air brake cooling so yeah we definitely want to get that one as soon as possible for the railing this is going to be a huge increase in and a lot of stats but once again we're going to be suffering dirty air tolerance which could potentially be a bit of an issue but we're getting a little bit back of that with the uh, new underfloor, which again, we have focused more balance. So it's not great for Baku, let's be honest, but that extra 0.097 Gs of high speed is going to be fairly massive on a lot of the other tracks. So we definitely want to put that underfloor on as well. And with that, we are now caught up on parts. And this is how our car looks come Baku. Best DRS, low speed cornering, medium speed cornering, high speed cornering, lacking top speed, but that is honestly what you expect with the strategies that I employ. And for the brake cooling and engine cooling, it's not great, honestly, but 50% is more than enough in your first season. We have probably sacrificed a bit too much dirty air tolerance here, I'll be honest. 44, 43.7% is a little bit too little. It's still acceptable because we will not be running behind a lot of other cars. But I definitely would like to get this up over the course of the season, but that's going to be difficult with regulation and just focusing on the rear wing and the front wing, which are two big sources of dirty air tolerance along with your underfloor. But honestly, this is actually kind of decent now. And if we compare ourselves to the Red Bull, we have a 0.100 cheese to go on in low speed. We have just a little bit more to go on in medium, 0.5-ish, 0.05-ish. And for the high speed here, we still have a lot to go on but remember now the red bulls have had their first few upgrades they still have some extra weight compared to us so red bull can still become a better car than us but at the current stage we are definitely uh better in terms of car performance let's have a look at uh, say compare the chassis as you can see the red bull's chassis is more focused on drag reduction engine cooling but we're pretty close in airflow middle so if they just uh, turn the lifespan down they're going to get a whole lot of uh they're going to get a whole lot of performance. Their front wing is better than us. Uh, we have focused it on low speed. They have not. They actually looks like more they focused it on high speed and brake cooling. Uh, as well as airflow sensitivity. So they're more balanced. Rear wing. We, again, have focused it. They have not. So they probably still have a couple of developments in incoming here. But this is definitely a focused side pod. It has minimum spec. So they're not going to have any huge gains there. Underfloor, we're still looking uh, dominant on the cornering, which is again what we expect. And this too is a focused uh, suspension, which again, more focused on a more balanced setup. So right now, Rebel has a couple of pieces they still need to design, but we have put Mercedes in a spot where they can potentially start dominating. And that's kind of the key here, because what we, what Rebel were the closest to us in was the medium speed cornering. But we have this front wing that has a little bit more medium speed cornering. We can focus a little bit more from the suspension over the course of this year. We have two slots where we can work on designs uh, alongside, uh, well, in this case, research. However, if you get a cornering regulation for the entire, entire, well, all the pieces, I recommend doing just research. But generally for this case, we can actually do two slots research, two slots design, which would make a life a little bit easier. But again, if you're getting hit with uh, regulations that are kind of hard, harsher across the board, I just say focus research. For now, though, we're going to jump into Baku and we're going to go ahead here and say that we're going to qualify both cars in the top six. And we're going to go for fast slap. We're going to say both cars in Q2. And for this one, we'll just go ahead and say the same thing. Both cars top six and be a little bit aggressive here. 
Let's jump into this, get quality done, and then we'll see what we stack up for the sprint. So with the recent upgrades, um, well, we are 1-2. We are just slightly ahead of Verstappen and Sainz in this case, but the upgrades definitely have had a bit of an effect on our car, and it's a positive effect. We're now 1-2 in quality, which uh, honestly I didn't think we would be. I think Verstappen sh would have been squeezed in between. Now we can of course get better qualities going forwards because the driver prep ain't there. That's going to 63 and 65. So with high confidence, we could definitely have had better results here. We're lacking some track acclimatization. We're lacking car pass knowledge. And again, once these go up, we're going to have an even more dominating, uh, well, performance here. But for the time being, there's nothing really to worry about. We are still early enough here that we're just going to go ahead and simulate the second practice right away. Usually you change to more one parts, but early in the season, that just isn't, well, possible. And added the bonus for here. One, two, in practice as well. Now, sprint here should hopefully be a fairly simple affair where we kind of run away from everyone else. And that is kind of what we're going to be hoping for. And you can actually run the sprint here on soft tires, full attack. You can also do mediums, full attack. And honestly, both of them are just as quick. So since we're starting one, two, we're going to go ahead and do it on soft tires with both of them. And the idea here is very simple. We push. We get away from the rest of the pack. We want to to the finish. And hopefully that is something that we can pull off here. It is a little bit risky to have two cars running together though. So we might actually, uh, you know, uh, artificially, if you will, create a little bit of distance to them. But for now, this should be a-okay. And we'll see if we can have a decent start and then just push away from the rest of the grid. So let's see how this uh, the the sprint, sprint opener goes. Looks like we had a bit of a decent start then, but uh, confidence-wise, you can see Russell is struggling a little bit. But uh, that shouldn't be too much of a problem here. Decent start. We held on to our positions. The Stappen is falling slightly backwards, which is nice to see. But uh, can we actually create enough of a gap here by the end of the second lap that... Verstappen is outside of DRS because that's basically how I would classify having a dominant performance here, having a dominant car. If we can, within the first couple of laps, leave the Red Bull behind, I'd say that is dominating enough that we don't really need to worry too much if uh, over the next few, well, races in terms of the upgrades. Because again, we can do upgrades if we want to. The main concern is actually going to be signs and Verstappen DRSing of each other. But currently, it's actually looking really, really good. We've gained about half a second on the course of the last lap. We're running just a few tenths quicker, let's be honest. But that is all you really need at the start here. Everyone is going to be pushing. And for now, we're actually just going to speed along and see if we can maintain this until the end of the sprint. We're now a little bit further in. And as you can see, we have extended the gap here to about seven seconds. And not only that, but everyone is running attack. So we've done it on... The same level of aggression and that is even bigger so i definitely dare say that currently we are in a bit of a dominating car and we'll see how uh, it looks come the race itself but for now we'll just speed along till the end of the sprint we're on the final lap of the sprint the gap has extended here to 13.6 seconds verstappen is fighting the ferraris so it's a bit of a weird world we live in but car is definitely uh, promising 13.8 seconds now behind uh, behind we find the Ferraris so yeah we definitely take that as a bit of a dominant performance for sure and we'll see if we can actually do that in the race itself now as we can see that while running the soft tire we were actually capable of extending a gap to almost 14 seconds what that tells us is that it should be perfectly viable for us to start on a soft tire, then go over to a medium tire, then go over to a soft tire again. Or we could also go ahead here for strategy and, well, not add a hard tire there. We could also go ahead and do something like this, which is actually perfectly viable around here. Do a one stopper, soft to hard. And while this is somewhat quicker, it does kind of require you to do overtakes, which honestly wouldn't be a terrible idea. 
uh, from the perspective that the fact that we are starting in first, we don't have a lot of confidence. But it does mean that we can do a one stop, we can do a two stop here, depending on what we feel like. And that is kind of, uh, you know, decent to have in our arsenal. And that is what we're going to be doing here. We're going to start on the softs. We're going to go very aggressive. And we're going to try and create a gap. And if we see that the confidence is low, uh, come the pit stops, we'll do mediums. If it's acceptable, uh, basically high or above, then we'll go ahead and <coughs> do a hard one stop. And I think that is a... A good way of doing things. It's the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Soft tire behind us, but also a couple of mediums. That is going to make life a little bit easier. Did not mean to click that driving clean air, but it worked. Didn't mean to uh, harvest either, so we're back to deploy. And we had it once again a really good start here. Both of our cars got away nicely. We have a little bit of gap into Leclerc. And I think we're going to instate that one second gap here on the first lap again, like we did in the sprint. Which would be pretty massive, because again, as long as we can get away from DRS distance, then we are basically safe because of the fact that uh, we have bad top speed. So they're going to be gaining on us under DRS. But if we can stay outside of DRS, uh, outside of the DRS of the car, behind so that we don't give him DRS that alone is good enough here that we can actually extend this gap pretty significantly pretty quickly I would think science is gaining right now but that's mainly because Hamilton is falling down behind Russell and once we get into the DRS zone here that should you know kind of correct itself although science is running incredibly quick gained about three to five tenths last lap I still think it would be okay for us right now this is really, really good. But it also worries him because the Ferraris are quick and the Red Bulls are slow. So I'm looking forward to seeing if they're going to improve later on. But for now, we're very happy with just allowing things to run as they are. And for Russell, confidence is up to very high. Same here for Hamilton. So we'll allow things to just stay as they are. As they overtake each other, they will end up with a little bit more positive... Uh, They'll end up with positive confidence from just DRS overtaking each other. So it's not really a net loss or anything like that. So it's perfectly fine. And with that, we might just go ahead and switch the strategy over to one stopper. Because already we have about seven seconds advantage down to science. But we'll see once we get closer to the pit stop. For now, we'll just allow time to uh, time to pass until we get there. Okay, red flag. And we actually have a red flag here. But as you can see, I uh, just wanted to show this before. We are 11 seconds ahead. We gain about a second a lap. And if we have a look at the uh, time consideration here, 20 seconds for a pit stop. We might have actually gotten ourselves into a position here where we could have pitted and come out ahead of uh, the Ferraris. So currently we're looking, uh, looking fairly dominant. And what I think we're going to do here is just jump onto another set of soft tires. That's probably for the best. I can see why that it would be a red flag. Uh, but yeah, what we're going to do is incredibly simple. Just jump onto another set of softs. Russell only has one more set of softs though. So that could backfire if we get another red flag towards the end. But I think that is, as I said, the best option we have. We go soft and then we might go medium till the end. So that is the option that we have ahead of us right now. Drivers have taken their positions again. Once more, they're ready to race. And it's lights out. And away we go. Okay, so after red flag, we need to go push and deploy because it's kind of like another restart. The other settings have been remembered, but we definitely need to go just push and deploy, and that should be fine. And Leclerc is actually getting a little bit antsy with uh, with Hamilton, so. Could be a bit of an interesting one. Paris signs there on the mediums. And hopefully they will be holding up Verstappen on the uh, soft tires further back. But we'll have to see. Well, also, again, going to be interesting to see if we can actually reinstate that gap. A bit of an incident so towards incident the back. Looks like it's just Every a yellow flag, way. though. Nothing in th nothing major. The Reese bumping into the uh, Alfa Romeo, I guess. Kind of. 
But yeah, nothing too major there. So once again, we've actually pulled away from Leclerc immediately, kind of like we hoped for. And since the energy now is down to about 30%, we're going to slow things down a little bit. But as a result, we might see Leclerc catching us because I think he'll be pushing until he's completely out of energy. But it should be fine as long as we, you know, reinstate the gap in the corner sections there. That's going to be the hope at least. And it is looking good. It looks like we kind of get this going. The Stappen though with fast slap is a bit concerning. He could actually come out ahead and uh, catch up to us. And what I do expect is that most cars will be going on to the mediums and just do a one stopper now. So the gap here is going to be important that we extend it as much as possible. But so far it's looking good. And with that we'll just speed things along until we get closer to the pit stop. Now we actually have a safety car, and that is a little bit problematic for a few reasons. Um, reason A, it's a safety car. Reason B, most of the packet is going to pit. Science, I don't think it's going to pit. Stroll's probably not going to pit, but everyone, say 80% and below, are probably going to end up pitting. Now, because a pit stop takes about 15 seconds under a safety car, uh, well, safety car situation, we can potentially pit both cars without losing possession. Provide, of course, that Leclerc, Paris, and Verstappen does pit. I think they will, because we're going to be running behind a safety car for a few laps, and that is going to slow us down significantly. For Russell, we are going to probably end up just putting him on a medium tire. Uh, it's either that or we put him onto the hard tire. And with the hard tire, he can go till the end. That's probably going to be what we do for him. For Hamilton, I'm actually a little bit unsure what is going to be our best bet here. Hamilton does have more soft tires for one so we could potentially put him on the medium here too gonna be a little bit harder to make it till the end or we just do what we did with uh with russell put him on the hard and in terms of strategy time as you can see hard here is just a better choice we could also see if we put him on to the soft tire and then a medium till the end how that will play out. Again, you can experiment with this as you see fit. Is that going to be any quicker? It's going to be quicker than the other strategy here. But that's going to also require us to kind of stay ahead. So it's a little bit hard to decide, honestly. Because again, we could see Leclerc maybe decide to stay out. But I think since we haven't seen any hard tires, that we're going to be seeing some now. And in terms of the compound performance here from the hard tires, they are not great. Uh, it take 20 laps before they become equal. The only, the main difference is that we can push them. So for Russell, that is also a bit of a problem here. Uh, what do we do? If we were to put him on the mediums, how would that look? If we do a very aggressive strategy of medium, medium, like so. As you look at that looks incredibly silly, but it is quicker than going on through the hard. So I think that's what we do. We put both of our cars on the medium. Uh, because we we don't really need to take advantage of the safety car, but we might as well do it. Put them on the medium. If we get a red flag later on, we can take uh, deal with that then. And as I said, I expect the AI to pit here because they are really proactive at pitting. Now this happens down at turn eight. And there's the contact. And they'll have to That is Leclerc's famous I am stupid crash. So as you can see, as expected, everyone behind us is pitting. And we did it we did keep possession. So there's nothing wrong with us pitting here. And we have cars going onto soft tires again. Leclerc Paris Alpha Sugar need to pit again. I would think, unless they really want to extend them. We see a hard tire in Gasly. But yeah, most cars say mediums or softs. So, kind of what we expected. Again, as long as the AI is under 80% tire, even 89%, as, you, as we saw with signs, you have to go and refresh those mediums. They will go ahead and pit. And depending on how many laps we do behind the safety car here, that could definitely also have a fairly huge effect on how much more extra tire wear you're gonna suffer so while it might look acceptable at the start of a safety car to stay out you think you'd hold an advantage 
you're still going to be losing some durability behind it. As you can see, we lost 4% already. And if we were on soft tire, we'd probably lose 6 or 7%. We were on 70, they'd be down to 63. We wouldn't really have any chance to create a gap to the cast behind. And as a result, when we do pit, even if we stay out and keep possession, keep uh, track position, it's not going to benefit us. So good that we pitted here. Russell, though, is getting immediately pressured by the Ferrari. And uh, potentially it's going to lose out a little bit here in the short term, because again, we are on a worse tire. We have immediately another yellow flag. Ocon this time. So it's been a pretty pretty wild race just from the incidents that we've had. And that is a just a light touch, so nothing major. But yeah, Russell here is gonna have a little bit of uh, a little bit of a rough one. Honestly, Hamilton's gonna too because we're on the medium tire. But I think we're gonna be getting all of this back a little bit further further down the line. We are going to be, again, pitting again, which is potentially going to backfire, but I think it's going to be worth it. We'll have to see. Leclerc is going to be running his tire down, his tires down at one point. But honestly, this uh, the safety cars, the red flags, definitely hasn't benefited us in any way, shape, or form. So it is what it is. We'll deal with it. For now, though, we'll just follow Leclerc, probably for the next five, six laps until his soft start really wearing out. And once that happens, we'll get the overtakes done and try and reinstate the gap that we had. And that is basically just how we're going to have to deal with the current situation. And Hamilton's already working on on that, but uh, might need to run a little bit of harvesting here and uh, take advantage of Leclerc's DRS because Leclerc is most likely going to have to pit again. This just I just don't see a uh, a world where he makes those softs last till the end. And if he does, he's going to probably end up regretting that massively. But Russell is creating the gap to Paris. That's kind of what we wanted to see. We're also getting a little bit of extra tow here with the DRS, I think. So that should be nice. Let's see now if Hamilton can create a gap to Leclerc. We're going to allow him to deploy for basically the entire period. And if we can create a gap to Leclerc, that's going to be massive. Now, we don't want to do have Russell attack immediately. Although he did kind of pull that off on his own there. Uh... Because if Russell catches up to, Le to Hamilton right now, he's going to be pulling Leclerc with him. And Hamilton just doesn't have uh, the energy at the moment to create a bigger gap. Uh, that is a bit of an issue. So we could potentially we could potentially make a little bit of a problem for ourselves here with Leclerc. That's kind of what's happening right now. now <laughs> As we see, a pit window has been entered. So... Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a weird one because we are kind of pulling Leclerc with us. Uh, the gap right now is good enough, so at the end of this lap, we're going to have Russell go all out unless he gets overtaken here, which he does. Yeah. The fact that he's struggling, <laughs> I still managed to say ahead is kind of nice, but at the same time, I would like him to just be behind into that second zone, but looks like he just isn't going to let up enough for that to happen, so... Let's deploy, see if we can get away from Leclerc. And that actually worked out pretty nicely. So pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And again, I don't think these tires are going to make it till the end. Um, they could potentially. But they're going to be completely shot by the time we get there. So we just want to get enough of a gap where we won't have to do too many overtakes before we pit. And we are kind of there already. We have signs. So Russell's going to need a few more laps, but Hamilton here, we can actually get in for his final soft stint. And I'm pretty sure he will be more than making up for the, the time lost by pitting. And he should come out maybe... Just about saying maybe he had a stroll, but nah, that was a little bit too much to hope for. And Russell has been caught up again, so... We're just going to have to pit him here, and it's just a shame that he doesn't have a fresh set of softs. Because you can see even these softs are quicker than our current set. But we'll put him on another medium. And he should be quick enough here that he will still be able to get back up onto the podium. That's what I'm thinking. For Hamilton, he will be kind of flying right now and hunting. Which is uh, what he is doing just on his own. He's already up into fourth. Paris should be next. You should be getting him this lap, I think. With the just the pace difference, you can kind of see him flying. And he should be getting in within the DRS zone. We'll just give it a little bit of extra push here so we don't get stuck behind for too long. 
And we'll do the same with Russell, of course, but for the time being, I'm happy with the progress. And Hamilton will be getting uh, safety car deployed. That is oh, actually is unfortunate. That is unfortunate for Leclerc. Yeah, <laughs> and also slightly unfortunate for us because we did pit earlier and we did have a tire advantage. Car. So this has been a really, really roller coaster of a. It's not unfortunate for Leclerc. We got a red, red flag. Red flag. Uh. Russell just has to go for fresh mediums. These softs are going to be better than any mediums we can have. So Leclerc definitely benefited highly from that. Uh, that red flag. Lights out, and away we go. Okay, so this is where we have 10 laps to go. We're going to have to go super aggressive. We have no confidence to speak of. And that is going to make life very much uh, difficult here. Hamilton with a really bad start. Loses out a bunch. And then we have... Uh, Then we have Russell now kind of competing with Hamilton, which is not what we want. We want to compete with Leclerc, but again, the fact that he got so lucky there, uh, because that is what he did. He did get lucky. His safety car, uh, for starters, did screw us over. The red flag screwed us over. Every incident this race that has, uh, that has happened has been putting us into a worse and worse position. There's just no way around that. So, he has been really lucky. I don't know why I'm not pushing fuel with Hamilton. That's my my fault. I'm a little bit too distracted by <laughs> just how unlucky we've been. We might need to harvest a little bit here with Hamilton. We'll have to see, though, if he can stay ahead of the Ferrari. And the question now becomes, can we push and get a bit of a gap going? Russell is also fighting Paris, which is, of course, not great. But the tire advantage that Leclerc has is just that huge. So... We're going to have to kind of manage now for the last few laps. Hmm. I think we can secure second and maybe third. Sorry, first and third, not second. Who would go for second and uh, this one because yeah it's been pretty pretty weird that's the best way i can describe it but we shall see so currently we actually have hamilton pushing away from leclerc which is nice but russell is going to be the big uh the big wild card we i don't think we're going to be able to catch Leclerc, that's the thing. I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen with Russell, but I can always hope. We are gaining in the twisty section, that's the thing. And with three laps to go, it is definitely viable, for one. We also have no data on the weather. It's because I uh, went and saved on the uh, on the save previous to this because I want to try and replay this without any big incidents and see just how dominated the car actually is. Uh, but I'll go over that after this, this has finished. So... Russell can actually catch Leclerc here. I didn't think he would let that much up. But he has used a lot of his medium tires. So I guess it makes sense. We don't really have the energy though. That's the main problem here. But Russell getting ahead now would be amazing. So let's just deploy. And we will keep deploying now until the end. Because the quicker the larger gap we create here the better. So, we still managed to put, pull it out of the hat somehow. I'm not sure I'm fully agree, agreeing with how this went, but it is a decent performance and we still managed to secure. Did we secure one and two here? I would think so, but that is another red flag. What an excellent result today. For the uh, this has been probably my most 
weird race so far, honestly. That was three red flags. Two safety cars. And a lot of confusion from my side. But yeah, we have actually made a fairly dominant Mercedes car. And as I said, we can just keep on developing it at this point. We can use a little bit more CFD if we need to. But the car right now is pretty dominant and is capable of finding Red Bull for sure. It's probably going to dominate in the future. But as I was mentioning earlier, what I did uh, was actually just save and go back to an autosave. Because I want to take a look at uh, how much of a difference we can actually make in an event where there aren't three red flags and two safety cars. So what we're going to do now is just take a very quick look at uh, the alternative reality where we had a clean race with no nothing much happening and see just how much of a gap we can actually create to the cars behind. So on the retry, not completely representative because, well, virtual safety cars, a lot of them, three. But we have a bit of a bigger gap here to the Ferraris behind, even bigger gap down to the Red Bulls. So I'd say we take that. And with that, I'd say that we are kind of set up now to dominate the rest of the season. I'm pretty sure that is what is going to happen. But the setup here has actually taken me quite longer than I anticipated. I've probably been focused a little bit too much on getting everything included. So as a result of that, this video has ended up being fairly long. And we are going to kind of cut it here. But honestly, at this point, your car should be good enough that uh, if you need to, using all four slots for research should be more than... Uh, acceptable but again if you really need to you can always just change things up as you see fit but at this point as long as you keep to aggressive strategies you should have no problem dominating the first season with mercedes and uh, that has kind of been the point of uh, setting this up it's been highly requested for a while so i thought i'd just get that out of the way and if there's something else you'd like to see please let me know below and for tomorrow hopefully we'll have a video on how you can kind of recover from a, uh, well, season of no research. So we'll be trying to get that out tomorrow. But yeah, probably put in a little bit uh, too much uh, information, particularly race information, maybe strategy into this video. But hopefully still, it has been entertaining. Thank you for watching. See you next time. And if you have enjoyed, please like and subscribe. Bye bye.